um, maybe I'll do like a little bit of it that Reb Mimi is the Mashbi'ah Ruchanit um, at Machon Shechter, which is um, in, in Jerusalem, which is the uh, Institute for the Masorti Movement, uh, affiliated with the conservative movement. Um, uh, so Machon Shechter in Israel. She was the Mashbi'a Ruchanit at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies, where I was ordained. She was a the first scholar on the Lishma program, which I which I uh, started at Camp Rama in California. Um, she was before that at the Yakar Institute in Jerusalem. She finished uh, a doctorate, so we are learning with. Dr. Reb and Rabbi, um, all together, Mimi Fagelson, and um, I'll let her tell you more about um, about the subject of that if she wants to. Um, but it was, um, if I, I can I say, it was in helping to rethink the way in which we do the dying process um, in the Jewish tradition. It was like a very short summary. I think, for, I think primarily it was a way of rethinking our funerals as the last chapter of our life versus the first chapter of our death. Amazing. What does it mean to show up at our own funerals? Amazing. So besides all that, um, I'll also say that Reb Mimi was the first uh, uh, Orthodox woman who was ordained as a rabbi, um, and she has rabbinic ordination. She's the only woman in the world who has rabbinic ordination from both Reb Shlomo Karlbach and uh, Reb Zalman. Um, and most importantly, she was present when our son Benjamin was brought into the world. And she is just an amazing and wonderful teacher. And I'm so grateful for her presence in my life and for the chance for our community to continue to learn with her. So I'm going to turn it over to her in a second. I will say one more time, um, if, you are, if you are unable to turn on your camera based on where you are, then um, that's okay. Um, but if you are able, I do really just want to encourage you to do so um, because it makes such a difference to people who are teaching um, to see each other's faces um, and, uh, and, and to our building a community of learning. So I will turn it over to Red Mimi. Thank you. What a blessing and what a gift. It's really amazing. It's amazing. And um, it's really, it's amazing to share your rabbi, your love with you. Because um, I know we've been walking together for a good 20 years. And that means that we've lived multiple life experiences together and changed each other's lives and continue to do so. so I'm grateful for that. And grateful every time that I get to experience your community with you. Thank you. Thank you for helping me become who I am and continue to be and to continue to become. And um, it was wonderful to walk the streets of Yerushalayim together. And now I get to make my way to, to Durham. And God willing in the physical, it'll happen again. Both of you will make your way to Yerushalayim, all of you will learn together, not only with the screen between us, but also physically present in Yerushalayim and in Durham, and we'll make that happen. But the uh, wonderful wisdom of technology is that we can actually be together now and, and actually have a sense of what it means to do quantum leaps, and to be in multiple time zones uh, simultaneously. So wanna... for me, um... As somebody did put in the chat, your voice is sort of going in and out. It may be as you get closer or farther away from the microphone or when you look down or up, but just let's okay. see. Okay, I'm gonna, cause I am actually linked in to ground line instead of wireless. So it should be more consistent. Um, and that being said, I will try to um, stay as close as possible or closer consistently. To uh, the microphone, okay? Yeah, and when you are looking up like that, it is definitely markedly better. Okay, great. Um, can I ask one technical question? And that's about the source sheet that I send. So I received it, and now I will put everybody. Uh, I'm going to put into the source into the chat um, the source sheet that 
that Mamie sent for this session and you can download that um, so that we have it. And okay. if you need me, Red Mimi, to share it at any time on the on the screen, I'm happy to do that for you. Okay, great. Because I would prefer as much as possible to keep us here together. And that's why I'd like to send them in advance so you have them. Because I will work with them, but this way we can see each other and have ongoing eye contact. So those of you who know, who've learned together, there's one thing that is consistent about me. Very little is consistent, but what is consistent, um, three things actually, I hold on to people for life. That's consistent. And um, we start with an igun and an opening prayer, and then we dive into text, okay? So the nigun actually, I was thinking as I was sitting here, thinking, singing to myself before, while I was still on mute is actually um, from the words that you have on your source sheet on page number four, kechui machem dvarim v'shuvu el Hashem, which is taken from Hosea, from Hosea. Um, and it's part of the Haftorah that we'll read Shabbat Shuva. Shuva Yisrael ad Hashem elokecha. And we'll see that pasuk return Yisrael till God. Shabbat Shuvah has the name of actually this opening verse um, in the Haftarah. And Kichuim Achem Dvarim V'Shuvu El Hashem, take with you, and literally it's saying, take with you words, take with you actions, Dvarim, can be objects, can be words. And I think especially when we're opening into a conversation about forgiveness and compassion, the power of words, what words do we take with us, what I want to say sometimes even objects in our life carry memories. Um, what, what do we hold on to? And if you look around your home and you think about some of the things that are there, like what are the story that they, that they are telling? So, take with us words, take with us actions, take with us objects, and with them to make our way towards the one. Echo imachem, imachem de vain. Shuve, shuve, lashem. I can't hear you, but I can see your lips moving or not. Echo imachem, imachem de vain. Shuve, shuve, lashem. Echo imachem, imachem de One and only. What a crazy, miraculous world we live in that we can sit here crossing time zones and cities and locations and carry so many different kinds of memories that we share and journeys that we've walked on and those that are waiting for us to walk together. And what a blessing that we have a tradition that brings us to a time to sit, to learn, to contemplate, to ask questions, and to share questions. For me, I always say that um, our questions are what we share, our answers are, are what separate us, but our questions are what we share. So I pray that we have comfort of sharing questions today, and we have courage in the answers that we find for ourselves and for each other. I chose this teaching to open our series, and we'll have, uh, God willing, I understand not next week, but after that, another two weeks of learning together on, our, on these Sundays as a way of preparing. And this issue, I want to say, of forgiveness and compassion, I started, uh, here's my confession, started looking at these sources, um, I want to say about 25 years ago. And it came actually as a challenge 
by Rabbi Mickey Rosen of Blessed Memory, the founder of Yatar, who challenged me to share time with forgiveness and compassion. Chemla v'mechila. In Hebrew, chemla, mechila, forgiveness, and chemla, compassion. I hope you can hear the connection between the root. And we also have the word milchama connected to that, war. We have the word hachlama, is to heal. We have lechem. We have hal, which is bread. We have halchama, which is to, 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 to mold, to meld together, like, like a metal. So I hope that we can feel that there's, I, I want to say when we're thinking about hachla, when we're talking about mechila and chemla, forgiveness and compassion, there's a, there's a process here. It's not only an intellectual process. It's not only an, an emotional process. But there are certain elements in, our, in, in the way we hold ourselves that demand of us multiple parts of our being to be activated simultaneously. And, um, and, and, I, and I also want to say that sometimes the challenge is how are we going to let different parts of ourselves be in dialogue differently? And what I mean about that is, is um, healing, and we'll see this, and we'll see this um, extensively. The question is like, what is, what is healing? And when we think about healing, forgiveness and compassion that bring healing to the world, when we think of the word healing, what do we mean? In regard to what do we compare healing? Healing in regard to what? So, for example, um, well, I haven't taught this material, this Gemara, I think, since I did my, my knee surgery. So, five years ago, I did double knee replacement so I could um, walk the streets of Yerushalayim. And I remember that the surgeon asked me, uh, well, what would be success for you? And I said, um, you know, I could, I, that I could sit in the lotus position, I could, that I could walk downstairs without holding on. And because I was so limited, I was literally so limited, I could not walk downstairs like an adult um, and one stair at a time holding on. I couldn't, right, I couldn't sit in the lotus position. And, and when I got, when after the surgery and I healed from the surgery, I realized that that's not sufficient. But at the time, I was so crippled and so limited that that seemed to me sufficient. So I also want us to think about healing in a way in which uh, we have in our tradition this notion of uh, time-bound mitzvot. Mitzvot that are connected to a certain, to a certain time of the year. Sukkah is a time-bound mitzvah. Shofar is a time-bound mitzvah. You can blow the horn whenever you want. You can sit in, under, in a gazebo whenever you want. But to fulfill the mitzvah of shofar or the mitzvah of sukkah, they're time-bound mitzvot. So I also want to think about um, this notion of, of healing when thinking about forgiveness and when thinking about compassion. Healing in regard to, to how far back, to how far forward. What are the boundaries and the limitations or the expansiveness upon which we think about healing? And the other thing I want to say is that I feel that for, especially when negotiating forgiveness and compassion, there's a way in which I experience an experience which is, which is similar to how I negotiate my prayer life. What does that mean? It means that my heart has multiple chambers, right? I remember that when I was in, uh, in the Soviet Union, in Poland with Reb Shlomo Felbach, so he was invited by the Polish um, Ministry of Education, of Culture, in 1989. And, I was, and the, one of the first things he said on the stage in Warsaw was, uh, you know, my parent, grandparents and your grandparents, they weren't always such good neighbors. That was an understatement. And then he said, um, you know, if I had two hearts, I would love with one heart and I would hate with one heart. 
but I only have one heart. So I need to decide whether to love or to hate. And I decide to love. Now, you want to have a little bit of an insight as to how I negotiate my inner world. I'm sitting there as a student and I hear what he's saying and I say to myself, yes, that's true. I only have one heart. But in my heart, I have four chambers. And in one chamber, I'm going to love love. And in one chamber, I'm going to love hate. And in one chamber, I'm going to hate love. And in one chamber, I'm going to hate hate. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. Because my heart is one heart. And yet, it has four chambers too. So I want to say the same thing in my prayer life. Right? The, 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 there's one chamber which is my intellectual chamber. And there's one chamber, which is my, you know, my philosophical chamber. And there's a chamber that's my emotional chamber. And there's my chamber that's a, that's a very simple chamber. And the, sometimes the, the God that I pray in the presence of is different than the God that I philosophically contemplate. Is different than the one I experience. Even when I say the God I pray to, or the pro, God I pray in the presence of, that again, right? Sometimes if I'm suffering, I don't say, is there a God? Isn't there a God? Does God hear? Does God listen? Ears, like, can I change God's will? Can the value of my words and my prayers? I don't know. Sometimes I pray and I ask for health, healing, success, companionship, partners, whatever. And then there's another part of my voice that will say, like, really? Like, what do you really believe in what just happened or what just came out of your mouth? I also want to say that in the same way that I live with this kaleidoscope of prayer life, I also want to say that when it comes to forgiveness and compassion, there's a really, there's a very, there's a really detailed, I want to say, footwork or heart work that's being asked of us. Right? And I think the Talmud that we're going to go into now is going to, ask, is going to ask of us also, how do we negotiate forgiveness? How far do we want to go? What does it mean? What do we need to do? And in order to forgive, I want to say ourselves, other people, um, forgive God. Right? I don't know about you, but I have a handful of claims in the presence of the one and only. So, and I also want to say that for me, that's not for me, that's not blasphemous. Now, I want to say, first of all, I'm not embarrassed to say anything blasphemous. Um, Rabbi Dan will tell you about that. Um, so, I also want to invite you to not hold back on your comments and your thoughts. I also want to say that sometimes I like I can uh, I, I allow myself to play safe. What does playing safe mean? Playing safe means that if I have a source that I can I can hang my blasphemy on, then I'm not shameless and I'm not proud and I'll do that. Okay, so for example, the midrash, which isn't on your source sheet, the midrash says. <laughs> Midrash says, the one and only. Now, I'm going to use the word God, the one and only, divine mother, as you could hear in my opening prayer. And I want to, I always I'd like to put it out there that I use different names for God, different genders for God, um, which means someone will get insulted at some point and someone will feel embraced at another point. So if I use any of these names for God, the divine, the one that you're not comfortable with, do me a favor, please take it out of the sentence, put in something that you're more comfortable with. Okay, and I apologize um, in advance because always somehow someone feels not seen or, and God willing, someone sees, feels seen in the names and titles that I use for God. So the Midrash says the following. It says, God is obligated to all of the mitzvot. We have a covenant with God and it's a, bi, it's a bilateral co covenant. God observes all the mitzvot. How does he observe the mitzvah of tshuva? How does God repent? The Piyasetna Rebbe brings us the 
Reb Kalona's comment, Shapira Piasetna, which is known as the Ish Kodesh, the Holy Fire, um, known very much because of the teachings that he gave over in the Warsaw Ghetto between 1939 and 1942. So he left us with a plethora of educational, and philosophical, and meditative teachings from before the war. But he asked this question. He asked. The he brings this teaching. How does God observe the mitzvah of tshuva? Which means that if God has to observe the mitzvah of tshuva, inevitably, inevitably, it also means that God transgressed somehow. Because otherwise, that mitzvah of tshuva would not be applicable to God. And it's inconceivable that there's a mitzvah in the Torah which is irrelevant to God. So therefore, when I say, God, I don't forgive you about this, for this, or I say, within the realm of my understanding and my experience, I don't have space for forgiveness. Right, that is still holding on to a relationship, and which is another question that I want us to be holding on to, and that is how do we continue to cultivate a relationship, for example, even when we are not willing to forgive yet? I want to say something about the word yet, and then we're going into the Talmud. Okay? What I have to, why yet? This year is Shemitah. I said, see, was a sabbatical. Almost over. Now, I think personally, I grew up the following. I grew up that you had to forgive everyone once Yom Kippur came. I mean, ideally, Rosh Hashanah, you had to forgive everyone. And if not, Yom Kippur. By Yom Kippur, you had to forgive. And when I grew up, I won't say matured, but when I grew up, sometimes it's not so simple. Sometimes it's not so simple to forgive. And I started to ask myself if perhaps we have a different paradigm. In our tradition, we have different cycles of time. In the realm of agriculture, we have Ola, Neta Revai, Shemitah, and then we have Yovel. And Ola is three years from planting of a tree. Netzarevai is four years. Shemitah is seven years. Then we have a cycle of seven of seven, 49 years, which leads us to the Jubilee, to the Ovel, which is 50 years. And for me, I have to say that this possibility opened up a realm for me to be thinking differently about forgiveness. Connecting it to Yom Kippur, connecting it to their immediate Yom Kippur. I mean, what happens if something happens in Elul? It doesn't happen. It happens. Right? If someone can uh, insult us in the, severely, and God, God forbid, in the next couple of weeks. So maybe the first immediate Yom Kippur, I'm not ready. Maybe what happened demands of me three years. Maybe it demands four. Maybe it demands. Seven. Perhaps there's something that is so dire that it's going to take a lifetime to forgive. Possibly. Possibly. So I also want to invite compassion for ourselves when thinking about the challenges of forgiveness. I, this concept, sometimes they talk about um, the holidays are coming early or they're coming late. But I can never figure that out. Rosh Hashanah, that's on the first day of Tishrei, no matter what. It's not early or late. It is what it is. But I want to say sometimes I feel that in terms of forgiveness, sometimes, sometimes they come a little early. You know? It depends. So I also, wanna, I also want to in, embrace this concept of having compassion towards ourselves in terms of the immediacy of what's being asked. And I want to say, we'll see that Gmara is going to offer a way of thinking about the different levels and qualities of what this process of forgiveness can and does look like. Okay, I'm going to pause for a moment. Questions?
thought. It's a little bit hard in this structure, but it is possible. I was just thinking that it can be really hard to forgive myself for not forgiving God. <laughs> and like trying to also then have faith moving forward, like forgiving God for not having the things that I'm working towards have, be there yet, but still having faith in God is kind of my wrestle this time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Then I also just, I want to hold on to this notion of forgiveness and faith because that's going to be in relationship with God, but it can also be in relationship to ourselves or into another person. Like, do we have faith in the possibility of change? Do we have faith that our forgiveness will be embraced? or respected, or honored, or even acknowledged. So what is the relationship between forgiveness and faith? Right? I want to hold on to that. Thank you. Other thoughts, comments? Okay. So. This is one of my favorite sections in the Talmud. I have a handful of favorites. And this is one of the favorites. And God willing, in the next couple of weeks, we'll, look, we'll dive into some Hasidic sources. But the Talmud is always a good place to begin. And this is definitely one that I'd like to, to hold on to. So I'm going to walk you through your source sheet so you know what you have in front of you. So um, the first page, the first page is... is um, as questions, and then you'll have the beginning of we're going to be in the tractate of Yoma at page 86a and 86b. You have a translation in English. Then you have, as it appears in the Talmud itself, which is a cross between Aramaic and Hebrew, although here actually almost all of it is Hebrew, is Hebrew, not all, but much of it. And on the last page, you have the psukim, the verses that the Talmud will. Um, work with so it's important to have them i find it's important to pull them out for a moment and have them on a page separately okay and i will tell you that nechama Leibovitz of blessed memory um, if you had an opportunity to learn some of her store sheets or to read some of her teachings um she used to because her her world was the world of, of the tanakh and she used to, in her cynicism, she was a very tough lady, an amazing teacher. You really would never even blink in her class. You just keep yourself awake every moment. But she would, um, and she would, she would tease the Shiva, Shiva men, especially. She'd say, the only way Shiva guys know any Tanakh is because they quote the, all the verses in the, in the Gemara. Right? They don't sit and learn Tanakh until Raviol bin Nun didn't really enhance the study of, of, of Tanakh, uh, of the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim um, in the yeshiva world. It was true. So I know Mickey Rosen, he said that the way I started learning Gemara was through Hasidut, because the Hasidic rabbis would quote the, the Talmud, and that's how I entered into that world. That was how he would teach me as well. So Yoma 86a, 86b. I'm going to read the Hebrew you have, and and the English, I'm going to go back and forth between the two. Um, and I do want to say if there is a word that I think is actually um, Hebrew, and I, I think it's English, but it's actually Hebrew, you let me know. Okay. Um, I actually, Rabbi Dan, I want to hold, a, I, if everyone has the sources, then we can stay, stay here. Okay. Okay, great. So the Gemara says the following, Amar Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina. Rabbi Chama, the son of Chanina, said, now I want to say something. There's a way, it's not a classic way. And I actually, I would, I would do this for years, and then I found out that actually the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe would do this. And that is to say something about the names of the sages. There's something about the names of the Tanaim and the Amoraim, the sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud, that there's a way of saying something about their names, about what they're going to be talking about. So Chama is like this heat. And there's this fire. And Chanina is, a, is, is, is about pardoning. 
So I want to say something about, are you on fire to pardon? Like, and there's a way in which I also want to say, it's work. Like forgiveness and compassion, it doesn't, it doesn't just show up. Like it, it's something, it's like a diet. I don't, you know what I say about a diet? Die with a crucifix at the end. No, it's like, it's, it's, just, it's a bad, it's a hard word. So I just want to say forgiveness and compassion, like forgive. Like what are we willing to give for it? Right, there's something that has to give also. And that's also true. So, Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina, what does he say? Gdolat tshuva, shemuziyah rizut laolam. Great is healing, and I am using this as forgiveness and compassion, because wherever the Talmud is going to use the word tshuva, I'm using this as a, as, a, as, a, as a template for forgiveness and for compassion. Right? So I want to, I want to talk about the difference, or I want to raise the, 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 the thought about the distinction between truth and healing. Because sometimes we're having to give on the level of truth. Or we're going to have to give on the level of the details. Who said what? How it happened? So are we, are we asking for truth necessarily? Or are we asking for healing? And then what does, what does healing mean? Right? And again, going back to that image of my, my knees, right? It was very sweet that I said, I want to walk downstairs and sit in the lotus position. And now that I can do those things, right? Had he asked me now what would be healing for me, I'd talk about like trekking in India. But it was so far from my reality at the time that I only went a few steps forward. So I also want to talk about forgiveness in the realm of Taking it step by step. It doesn't have to be everything immediately. Rabbi Dan, yeah. Why are you juxtaposing healing with truth? In other words, if, you, if I might juxtapose truth with lies, I might juxtapose healing with injury. So I'm curious where, where that juxtaposition is coming from. Um, I think the juxtaposition is juxtaposition is coming from elements that withhold the possibilities of healing. Like what are the mechanisms that we have that have potential for holding us back? Right? Like for example, I will say, like with children, you can see they want truth. He said, she said, they did. And there's a way in which truth has to, um, truth um, represents being seen. And I want to say that healing, right, there are scars in healing. There are scars in healing. Now, in some traditions, those scars are, we own those scars or we earned those scars. And sometimes they're a really painful reminder. So, um, and sometimes healing, the notion of healing can alter the way we interpret truth. Would you... And then I see Deborah also has a question. Would, would you juxtapose healing and, and justice? You know, when you were saying that kids want, he should see, said, they want justice. So um, I'm going to ask them, how do, you, how do you negotiate the distinction between truth and justice? Right, that's going to be that's, that. That I think is a, a question I'm going to hold on to, because um, restorative justice. What kind of what kind of justice are you asking for? That will also talk, and we're going to. And I want to. The Gemara, I think, will negotiate that as well in terms of different qualities. So let's look at the Gemara further down, and then I'm happy to come back to 
your question, because it may be that Rabbi, that Reish Lakish is going to create that distinction. Deborah. You're on mute. Hi. Hi, Hi. Rabimi. Hi. Hi. So nice to see you. Amazing. <laughs> um, so this, your teaching has amazing relevance specifically in a very specific way to my life. I have young adult children, two of whom were very angry at me about stuff around my divorce from their father and, and things I said when I was very upset. But what's interesting, and we've been in family therapy together, one very interesting thing that the therapist pointed out is the different the different ways we perceive reality. So for example, I said something and one of my daughters, literally, I was sitting right next to her. She thought she heard it as something else, something much more hurtful and devastating than what I said. I said something that wasn't hurtful, shouldn't have been hurtful or devastating at all, right. but she heard it in a way that would have been a hard, it would, you know, that was like a horrible thing to say. And so I really appreciate what, well, I'm interested in your take on that reality that we all do perceive things differently, and especially when there's upset involved. And um, could you repeat what you said a moment ago about uh, being seen? Uh, it's a symbol for being seen. I asked if justice was about being seen. Right. Right. And not, right, not as much as being seen and acknowledged. Right. And my daughters are very involved in restorative justice movements. They're in their early twenties at university. Super right. woke. Not not that there's too much wrong with that, but um, it complicates this kind right. of thing. They're they're purists. I want to say something. I want to I want to allude to a moment to a mystical tradition, and then I want to talk uh, relationship for a moment. Okay. Yep. So in the mystical tradition, um, you know, you walk into your room and there's someone that you immediately connect with versus you walk into your room and there's someone, it's like nails on a chalkboard. It doesn't matter how wonderful they are, kind they are. It's something just rubs you in a direction which you just like want to run. So the image that I have is that we were all standing together at Sinai. The people that I'm madly in love with immediately, we were standing very close. So what we saw was similar. The image we saw, the experience of revelation was very immediate and very close and not identical, but close. Those other people, I would never say that they weren't at Sinai, but they were on the other side of the mountain. It's not people that were standing closer than me that I only saw the back of their head or people behind me that if I turned around, I saw their face, right? They were there, but they were on the other side of the mountain. So sometimes, right, even though they're physically sitting next to us, in my image, they're on the other side of the mountain. So it can be that your daughter heard one thing and you heard something else, right? Even though you're, so I would say, yeah, you're together at Sinai, but one is on one side of the mountain and one is on the other side of the mountain. So from a mystical perspective. And the other is um, about intimacy. Now, I think Rabbi Dan, I think I can share this. So I remember, without mentioning names, when we were at Lishma together, um, not our first summer, second or third, I said something to you. I don't remember what I said, but there was a third person that was there. And they said to me, you know, that was a very harsh thing to say. They were giving me tochacha, they were rebuking me for what I said to Rabbi Dan. And I smiled and I said, oh, that was a Talmud Chaver moment. That wasn't a Rav Talmud moment, right? That comment actually... The first half of the sentence was a rab, a teacher to their student. But the second half of the student was a friend, like a talmid chaver, a rab to a talmid chaver. We were, in, it was a friendship piece, right? Now, Rabbi Dan and I, we were great because we can make the movement very easily. A half a sentence can be with one voice and the second half of the sentence can be with another voice. But if you're not, if you don't have the, understand the intimacy of the relationship, then you hear it in a certain way. Right? If there's 
you don't have a, have a history or, or a, a, a multi-layered experience of language or frames of reference, then, then, then things are heard very differently. Right? You know, I, I, I was sat on a Shabbat table um, yesterday, Friday night, two nights ago, um, and there was a, an Israeli uh, Arab woman at the table, and she was describing um, a very painful situation that she was in, and a, and a, and a you know, security check, and and um, and someone at the table said said like said to me, um, well, you must know what it's like in terms of discrimination and as a female Orthodox rabbi. Um, and I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know her experience. I, I can listen to her experience. I can hear her. But there's a piece of her experience that I don't know and I can't understand. Because it was her experience and I was never in that experience and I never will be in that experience. But I can compare it to being told that I'm not at home where I'm at home. But yet, but I can't. So that's why I want to also pose this possibility of thinking about intimacy, how that manifests in the relationship, and how we hear things differently, and how for one for one person it's a good joke, for another person it's a bad joke, and for a third person it's an insult. And that's also true. Okay. Gemara, Gemara, Talmud. Mimi, um, Ayala raised her hand. I just want to make sure you knew. And for those who joined us a little late, I'm going to put a copy of the text into the chat again. Great. Ayala, yes. So I was thinking about this juxtaposition of truth and forgiveness. And it just landed so deeply for me because. I got divorced 23 years ago and I thought I had done my forgiveness work. And I realized recently it re you know, some, something resurfaced there and I went, Oh, there's still work to be done. And I realized that the forgiveness that I thought had done had more to do with letting go for the sake of my son, relationships of family, and now what I'm thinking from what you said is that maybe it's now about suspending truth in order to access forgiveness. Right. And, and, and I also want to say at, at some point at times, it can be a question of the quality of life that we want to live. Right? That comes back a lot to the health question. How important is our health to us? And what are we willing to do for our health and for our well being? And our priorities change. And I want to say the way we honor ourselves and the way we want, we claim our well being also evolves. And that also changes the truth, it also changes our sense of justice. It also changes our concept of healing. And are we healing the relationship? Are we healing ourselves? Are we healing our heart? What part of ourselves now can, also I wanna say at times, it's not time yet. We can't do that work yet. And sometimes we, move, we, we hold on to functionality because that is our lifesaver. And then there comes a point when that's not enough for who you are and for how we want to be with ourselves, let alone with someone else. Salto. Salto. Sounds like there's a birthday there. Okay, great. So we're talking about healing. Then I'm going to skip a little bit because of our wonderful concept of time. 
And there's a question of intentionality, right? When, what is the category and the criteria of, of, of intentionality? When a person intentionally means to hurt our feelings, when a person intentionally means to slide us, when, right? At, to what extent? Right? And here the Gemara uses the concept of this wayward. No, there's a, like, like I, as I often say, there's a difference between a kid filling their milk and a kid playing with their milk and it spills. The way we negotiate it, the way, so sometimes like, if it, if it, things happen, right? So if it, then we forgive, we let go of it. If we see someone playing around with it, then we know that that wasn't, that, that the chances of the milk spilling, so to speak, were greater. So uh, the question of intentionality here is really a crucial one. Um, because it also, it also is, um, you know, here's an, here's an, an, an image that will be um, age revealing. A paper, a pencil, remember? A pencil with an eraser, remember, right? And how hard you wrote and then, right, would it determine how the quality of how you could erase from the piece of paper? So I want to say that there's an intentionality of like how hard you write with that pencil. And then when it's erased, what does the paper now look like? And are there just smudges? Is it clean? Right, the eraser that takes some of the pencil. Right, there's a there's a there's a metaphor here. Right, because we're going to get a little schmutzy in the process of forgiveness, because we've got to go back in, and we have to do some cleaning, and that means that we're also going to have to see ourselves differently or ask ourselves to hear differently. Can we? Maybe not. And I remember, go back to three, four, seven, 49 years. It's also true. It's also true. But there's a question of intentionality, right? I also want, I want us to, to skip a little bit. Amar Rabbi Levi. Amar Levi. Rabbi Levi said, great is repentance as it reaches the heavenly throne, as it is stated, return Israel to your to the Lord your God. That's not my translation. Okay. Why is this so important for me? On the one hand, I want to ask the question: how far do you want to go? Reish Lakish is gonna go gonna push us on this question in terms of do I want things to go, do I want status quo? Do I want peace of mind? Do I want my, my best friend back? Right? Do all I want is that we can walk into shul and not hate each other? Do I want to be able to walk into shul and be able to daven with a peace of mind while they're sitting close by? Do I actually want to have, you know, sit next to each other at Kiddush? Do I want our kids to have a play date again? How far, how far do you want to go? The potential? Yes, it is possible to go that high. Now, I want you for a moment to look at your sources on page number four, because uh, I want you to look for a moment um, at, the, at um, verse 30 from Dvarim, Deuteronomy. And you, when you are in distress, all these things will come upon you. Thank you very much. Not so much. In later days, if you turn to God, this is the pasuk that Rabbi Levi was quoting, and you are obedient to his voice. Right? To his voice, the Gemara doesn't bring. It says, Vashafta ad Hashem You can return to God. Now, why to his voice? Vishamata bekolo. Where do we have the hearing of the voice? Where's the first time we hear a voice? So 
גן עדן? כל השם מהלך בגן. כל השם מהלך בגן. God's voice in the garden. Which I want to say, there's something, I actually, and I'm not cheering because it only really came to me, and I don't know, I can't explain why I was sitting in the morning with my, with my soul brother Or, um, and his Ima is here, last week. And we were learning a teaching from the Meshi Loach on Gan Eden, and this notion of transgressing in the garden. I don't know, there was something about this, for me, it hit me very close, this possibility of you can be in the most perfect environment and flip. Right? You can be with your lover and something's going to happen. A word, a, a glimpse of the eye. Uh, you know, you're just going to move your head for a moment. They're going to feel ignored or in, invisible or, right? There's a, there's even, there isn't even a promise of Gan Eden being complete and whole without transgression. And the Gemara says in Masech Pesachim, when it talks about the seven things that um, existed before creation, one of the seven is Shuva. The seven things, right? Tshuva kadma la'olam. Now, what this means for me is to say tshuva kadma la'olam means, on the one hand, it means that sin, transgression, was before it was creation. Because you only need tshuva if there's something to do tshuva on. You only need tshuva if there's, if there's, if there's transgression. So number one, it means that, that transgression is a given. You know, at Ziegler at the time, I remember I would say to my students, not my first year, because my first year I thought that I was, you know, I was great. But my second year, I knew I wasn't so great. You know, my first year, I thought they all needed to love me and I needed to love, it was like totally. But it's like by the second year, I got like a sense of reality came in. So I would say to them, you know, I need to tell you a couple things. Number one is God pays me to love you. Rabbi Arson pays me to teach you. No one pays me to like you. That's in your hands. If we like each other, that's in our hands. Right? We have to learn together. You pay tuition, I get paid. That's where, right? And God pays us both to love each other. Um, now, by the second or third year, I would say to them, here's the thing, guys. There's one thing I can promise you. Some of you, God willing, not all of you, but some of you, I'm going to insult. I'm going to hurt. I'm going to say something five years together. If I haven't insulted you, that means that our relationship wasn't real. Somewhere it's going to happen. You're going to hurt me, and I'm going to hurt you. So we're just going to have to figure out how to negotiate a real relationship, and we're going to have to learn how to say I'm sorry to each other. That's what we're going to have to learn. But I can't promise you I'm not going to hurt. I can't promise you that I'm not going to say something insulting, or I'm not going to use the phrase that you're going to find compromising. So I want to say, when the Gemara says that Shuvah Kadma Olam, it tells in the transgression, transgression, yes, Transgression also existed before creation. But it also means that everything that was created was created with the possibility of tshuva. Because no one can say, well, this was created before tshuva existed and therefore tshuva doesn't apply to it. But if I say tshuva preceded creation, then anything that was created was created in a reality where tshuva exists, which means it has a potential for tshuva. And then using this pasuk and saying, right, Vashavta Ada Shemalokecha, and you return all the way to God, Vishamata Bikolo. Right? Do you think that you are more perfect than Adam and Eve? Do we, right? There's something very humbling to say, we're all gonna blow it. Like there isn't anything more human. Than missing the mark. There isn't anything more human. Right? A relationship it can't be a relationship can't be a perfect relationship without the challenges. We can't promise each other we're not going to hurt each other. 
No, we're going to promise each other that we're going to stick around after that happened and we're going to figure out how to clean up, clean up each other's mess. But not that it's not going to happen. Right? If someone tells you, right, if, you have a, if you meet a partner they say, I promise you I'm never going to hurt you, I'm like, I'm not standing under the hoop with that person. If he says to me, tell me how... Tell me how I need to apologize. Tell me how I need to make it better so that when that happens, I know what to do. So oh, I can do that. I can do that. So Rabbi Levi is saying, and again, Le- Levi, escorting, Levaya, to escort. Right? He's saying, and, and how, far do you want to go? how far do you want to go in this process of forgiveness? How deep down, how deep do you want to dig for, in this compassion journey? And it's our prerogative how far we want to go. Because that is really what I want to say. Rabbi Yochanan is saying, Okay, Rabbi Yochanan says, and I see our time is coming close, but we have infinite time. When Rabbi Yochanan says, Shuva is so great that it overrides the prohibition in the Torah. Now here it brings a really complicated and detailed and not such a pretty example. So I'm going to do the dirty and I'm not going to bring the example. I'm just going to bring the principle for a moment. And I, if you want, I'll come back to it. I'm not afraid of it. What does it mean that the tshuva is so great that it overrides a prohibition in the Torah? It means we set down ground rules and then we decide for, for the sake of the re- relationship, I'm willing to surpass those ground rules. Right? How many times do we say, if this happens one more time, I'm out of here. And that one more time happens. And I say, I know I said it, but the relationship is still more important. Right? An extreme example is the notion of Yisurim Shel Ahava, afflictions of love. Right? The Talmud talks about the qualifications of what define afflictions of love, and there's a wonderful controversy between Rabbi Yechia and Rabbi Yaakov Ba'idi. One says afflictions of love, meaning we're innocent and God is afflicting us because God loves us. That's a whole other conversation. One says afflictions of love is as long I can endure anything as long as I can pray. One says I can endure anything as long as I can learn. And I love to pose this question for each, of, each and every one of us. What is, that, what is that line? Master the world, divine mother, one and only. I can endure anything as long as you don't. Or as long as I. What was it? In Tuesdays with Murray, as long as I could watch a baseball game and eat ice cream? Wasn't that what he, like he wanted to live as long as he could watch a baseball game and eat ice cream. Okay. So like we each have a decision. I know like for here's for myself. I said, master the world. You can do anything you want with me. My mother, keep your hands off her. Keep your hands off my mother. Now I have to tell you that it didn't happen because he's afflicting my mother. And I'm not walking away. I, I define that as my Yisurim Shalava. And he's afflicting my mom. May she have healing. And I'm still not walking away. So this is what Rabbi Yochanan says. He says, sometimes we make blanket statements that we actually believe in the moment that we made them. And then there's something higher that draws us. Rabbi Misha Misagya, last question of the, of the day. So, uh, so a radical question, which is uh, thinking about um, the kise of God and the implication that God is sitting as opposed to standing and the, the um, stance of sitting, that it, it, it's a much more gentle stance. And I'm also thinking about what you were saying about uh, how chuba is, is created before creation. And so my radical question is, so why did God need chuba, right? And how does and how does sin, because then you said, which implies that sin also existed before creation. And so the radical question is, 
why does God need sin? How does sin help God? How does sin, how did sin help God in creation? And if we're creators every day of our own lives, how can sin help us? Compassion. What, why compassion? Because God, this is where I'm sitting right now, okay? If God didn't know sin, that would mean that one of the most human experiences would be outside of the divine realm. Why does the Gemara need God to lay tefillin? Why does the Gemara need God to pray? Because the Gemara, the Talmud, needs God to be part of experiences that are core to who we are. And then that means that when we transgress, when we sin, there's a part of our divine image that is still with us. And I think that at times, the greatest gift that we can give someone to take that first step of tshuva is to help them reconnect to that divine part within them. So we need a God that sins so that when we sin, we can still be connected to a divine element within ourselves. And that there isn't a part of ourselves that is ever truly completely disconnected from God. And I don't think I've ever said that before, so I really wanna thank you for the question and the comment, and I need to sit with it. But that for me is like, I think about it in the Gemara, why God needs to pray, why the Gemara needs God to pray. It doesn't ask, does God pray? It just says, how do we know that God prays? So I'm saying like, why does the Talmud need God to pray? Because prayer is such a core part of who we are, especially after the destruction of the temple. How could it be that God doesn't pray? So God for the rabbis has to pray. We just need a proof text for it. So I would say the same thing, coming back to the Shamata Bekolo, going back to Adam and Chava and sinning in the garden, right, is... And maybe Adam is saying to God, where are you? Like, that's how I like to read that pasuk, that we don't know what God said to Adam. But Ayeka is Adam's response to God, where are you? So we need, we need a sinning God so that we don't lose our sense of self and our humanness and our divinity in any action. Because the truth of the matter is the vitality that we use, the chiyut that we use, it's not, God doesn't have, a, the Tom of the says, the Moshe Kodovil says, it's an act of God's compassion, that God doesn't activate the pause button when we want to do a transgression. Your Moshe Kodovil, student of the teacher of the Ari, says it's God's compassion that he doesn't take away from us the possibility of, 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 of transgression. And I, um, I want to, and I, and I want to, I don't want to, I don't want to transgress with Yezo's mom with holding, holding on to your time and God willing in two weeks we'll meet again and these questions will, will, will turn within us and we can come back to them even though we'll be looking at a Hasidic teaching, we can still bring in this Talmud, right? It's never over. Um, but there's an intimacy question, right? Sometimes that, that, that transgression brings us closer. Like we don't, we only realize how, how dear someone is when we almost lose them. We, right, uh, how important that book was until we can't find it. So I want us to, uh, I, think, I think also in those, in, those, in, those, uh, in those terms, in terms of the gift of the transgression, in terms of, right, of, 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 of um, whether it's ourselves and our dignity and our truth and our healing, whether it's a situation, whether it's something we want to do for someone else, bring them to a higher place of where they can be in their life. Um, God willing, we will have opportunity um, in two weeks and then three weeks to continue our learning and this journey of Elul. One and only Divine Mother. What a gift to have all of your children that are here learning together and those who were and left along the way join us to come together to understand and to actually devote, devote an hour of our life to bringing more healing into the world.
And what a gift to do this together. To Reb Mimi, to da. What a beautiful way for us to end Rosh Chodesh Elul as the sun goes down. <laughs> and we yeah. wish everyone many, many blessings. You're ahead of us, already started with the with the rest of Elul, and um, and we'll look forward to coming back together. Um, just to make sure people know, um, we're taking off here in America. It's Labor Day weekend. And, I was uh, wondering what was going on next week. I said something. What's happening? Yeah, yeah. like almost there, this rabbi, I'm guessing Rabbi Misagia, will also be doing weddings. It's Sunday, Labor Day weekend, everything. Um, so uh, we will come back together on, on uh, Sunday evening, September 11th. 